You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 383, Revelation 13. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, what's going on? Not a whole lot new this week, Trey. I I did not get called any names this week, so yeah. I don't really have much to report. I'm sure you did. You just didn't <laughs> see it somewhere. Somebody called you something. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah isn't that the truth? <laughs> I'm yeah. sure it happened somewhere. Absolutely. And we're still on target. I mean, no pool, no beach. No, no, sideways. no updates there. Okay. I've, All right. No, no, sure no new pool in. adventures. All right. Yeah. All right. Just or the beach. In. Well, Mike, uh, this week, uh, 666, the number of the beast and uh, all that good stuff. Please tell me you've made it exciting for us that uh, <laughs> the government's program well, with the vaccine and all right, that Right. Which right? political figure? <laughs> right. Oh, I could find lots of political figures in Revelation 13. <laughs> yeah, make it relevant uh, for today, you know, spice it up. Yeah. Some, you know? Yeah, we could do that. We could do that for sure. We could more or less say anything we wanted to and call it Bible teaching, and somebody out there is going to believe it. So that's yeah. that's the tragic state of affairs that we're all in. Yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, uh, you know, and, and and you know, as a segue, speaking of the pool and and the beach, you know, we have the beast rising out of the sea. You get that? That's my that's my lazy attempt at a segue, Trey. I know that's perfect. So, I can just see. Uh, Maury the beach is a bad place a, now. So, you know. Maury pop. Somebody's going to got to make a meme of Maury or somebody popping out of the pool like the beast. Oh, I know. Out of the sea. Yeah, out give him perfect. seven heads, man. That'd be awesome. <laughs> seven headed <laughs> bug. There you go. Right. <laughs> Everybody would die from the cuteness. Uh, yeah, he'd be up for that. So, well, let's jump in here to to chapter thirteen. I mean, you know, this is one of those chapters where. There are some obvious things, uh, and of course, you know, sprinkled in there is going to be some not so obvious things. And you know, we're going to stick to our, you know, trajectory, Old Testament backdrop for this sort of stuff. So there, you know, the I, I can sort of telegraph where we're going to go here. But as far as the beasts go, there's two of them, you know, in this chapter. There's plenty of Old Testament antecedent material that that could factor into that. When it comes to the number, uh, not so much. Uh, that that you know, when we get to that point, I will mention a few, uh, a few sort of, you know, I'll call them trajectories, but but they're 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 really just speculative. Even though I think, I think more highly of one than the other. Uh, at the end of the day, they're both still speculative as far as an Old Testament connection or context. So. As we jump into this, I'm gonna I'm gonna just read through the chapter real quickly. It's not that long, and then we'll start off with the two beasts. So, reading ESV again, verse one. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb, who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Verse 11. And I saw another beast rising out of the earth. First one was the sea, this one's the earth. 
It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that none can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, again, since we're focusing on Old Testament stuff, you know, we're not going to, you know, get into too many interpretive things here. But there are, again, some fruitful trajectories as far as how to contextualize the content here. Uh, the, the most obvious you know, is having to do with the beast. There are really two options here. Again, two interpretive trajectories that are, are possible with respect to contextualizing the beasts, both of them, with the Old Testament. Now, one of these is going to be pretty obvious. The other one is probably not going to be obvious. And, and so I'm going to go through both of these. I don't really feel compelled to only go with one, the more obvious one. Uh, I think that there's actually both in play because the, the, most, the more obvious of the two is, of course, what's going on in Daniel, Daniel 7, you know, with the, the sort of nondescript, you know, final beast and whatnot, so on and so forth. But there are disconnections from that. For instance, in, in Revelation 13, as we read, there not, there's not just one beast, there's two. And one is from the sea and the other one's from the land. And, and, and there is, again, some Old Testament precedent for two beasts, sea and land, that would have importance here or relevance is probably a better word. You know, for the, especially if we look at what's going on in Revelation 13 as sort of Babel chaos, not reborn, because we've we've always got Babel chaos. Okay, again, chaos. When I use that term, I mean everything that is not Eden, anti-Eden, specifically tied to the corruption of Eden, which you have supernatural rebellions lurking behind that. You have human rebellions lurking behind that, and and they are basically symbiotically related. My fullest expression of that to date is in the demons book, where I I try to you know flesh all that out in detail. There's a little bit of an unseen realm. But the, the demon's book sort of takes up that that cause, as it were, to go after the three rebellions uh, explanation for why the world is a chaotic mess. So when I say, you know, chaos, I'm referring to the loss of Eden, everything that is that is not Eden, it, which means we're, it's it's things associated with death, disorder, you know, the decreation of what of the order that God instituted in Genesis one. The, these sorts of themes, death, decay loss, estrangement from God, fragmentation of humanity, all of this stuff is chaos. And Babel is a sort of a, a center point, most obviously the third rebellion, what happens at Babel with the fragmentation of, of humanity and the sons of God being assigned to the nations. But the other ones also have certain threads that, that connect them as well to the Babel theme, because geographically, if we take the geographical descriptions like Genesis 6, it's Noah, the flood, we're in the Mesopotamian part of you know, the world. And the imagery of the flood, again, is often a theological response or polemic to material from Mesopotamia. So there's that. And if you go even back to the first one, there's a good bit of material in, in, in Genesis, Genesis 3, this first rebellion, that you know, also connects in some way to Babylon, Babylonian material. I mean, there, there's, you know, it's not that it's isolated to Babylon. You've got Canaan material as well, Canaanite. But if you loop in the Ezekiel 28 repurposing of this supernatural rebellion in the divine council, well, Ezekiel obviously writing from Babylon, there you go. You know, so you've, there's a number of things going on here that just connects all of it, the whole chaotic mess 
to Babel, Babylon, both in terms of the, his, the history of the biblical story as it's told, again, the geographical orientation, the textual material that's used to tell the story, and then ultimately Babylon becomes the, the, the foil, you know, for all that is terrible, all, all that, you know, this ultimate reversal like in the exile. Before that, you get Egypt playing the big bad role, and then you get Assyria, and then you get Babylon. But it's interesting how all three are described in chaos terms, and a number of which are Babylonish, even if it's not Babylon itself, even if it's Egypt or Assyria or something like that. So there are a lot of interconnections here. Again, it would take a whole book, you know, to to, to ferret out all of them and, and just go through all the material. But I, I think that's a necessary backdrop, because if we look at Revelation 13 sort of generally as the war against chaos or chaos's war against the people of God and the plans of God. That opens the door a bit to the less expected backdrop to the two beasts. I mean, the first one is Daniel, Daniel in Babylon, Daniel 7. That's going to be easy when we go through it to see that. But the other one is a little bit unexpected. So I'm going to start with the lesser expected of the two. So of the two trajectories, let's let's go to, for example, the beasts of Job, okay, Job 40 and 41. You have the sea beast and the land beast. Elsewhere in Scripture, they're going to be described as Leviathan and the, the twisting serpent Leviathan, the, the, the chaos imager that basically is known throughout the ancient Near East. And the land equivalent to chaos is Rahab. Okay, the, the land counterpart to Leviathan is Rahab. You actually get Rahab, you know, mentioned in, in, in the same chaos context as Leviathan normally is in Psalm 89, for instance. So there's a land and a sea chaos monster, two of them in the Old Testament. And what, what again, this isn't unique to me. I'm going to quote from Beale and McDonough here in a moment, but you've got scholars, again, who have obviously notice this, and they're well acquainted with the land and the sea chaos beast from the Old Testament. And so this, this seems like a natural trajectory to follow. So Beal and McDonough write, write and this is again from the commentary of the Old Testament uh, in the New Testament, edited by Carson and Beale. They say the depiction of the two beasts in chapter 13 is based in part, and again, that's, that's appropriately worded, in part on Job 40 and 41 which is the only place in the Old Testament that portrays two satanic beasts that oppose God. The only two that, the only time where they're together. Elsewhere, they're separate, Leviathan, Rahab, so on and so forth. The sea monster of the Job passage also has a companion classified as a land beast. The term is Therion, in Septuagint anyway. That's Job 40, 15 through 24. Now, both beasts are described with demonic attributes and are said to have been, quote, made to be mocked by the angels. Now, you don't, if you're, if you're quickly looking back and where, you know, what was the verse there? Okay, it's Job 40, 19 and 20 and Job 41, 24 and 25, more importantly. You're not going to find it because this is the Septuagint. So I'm going to just open the Septuagint here real quickly and read some of this stuff, because it, again, since we don't really read the Septuagint, this is a little bit surprising. So wait till you, you hear this. So Job, let's just go to Job 40 in the Septuagint. So, so Job 40, 19 and 20, this is describing again, Leviathan. So I'll go about up to verse 18. If a flood should happen, it is not taken notice of it. Trust that the Jordan shall rush up to its mouth. Shall one take it in its eye? Um, again, describing, you know, basically creatures of the deep and, you know, their their effect on the land and this flood language, so on and so forth. Being caught in a snare, shall one pierce its nose? Now, that, that's language that's going to be familiar from your English Bibles about Leviathan. Verse 20, and you will lead the serpent in by a fish hook and put a halter, or it's a question, and will you lead the serpent in by a fish hook and put a halter around its nose? Obviously, no, you know, Job, you can't control, you know, Leviathan. This is, it's Leviathan. You know, you're no match for it. If you keep reading in, in Job 41, again, in the Septuagint, here are the last two verses. 
There is nothing upon the earth like it being made to be mocked at by my angels. It sees everything that is high and it, it itself is king of all that is in the waters. So it's real interesting, again, in the, in the Septuagint, you've got the, the, the big symbol for chaos, the Leviathan, the sea beast, is going to be mocked by the angels. Now I'm going to go back to Beale and McDonough. They, they keep going with this, this trajectory. The two beasts of Job 40 and 41 are echoed throughout Revelation 13, again, especially in the Septuagint. Because Revelation is Greek, Septuagint is Greek in these two chapters. One is called the dragon from the sea. That's Job 40, 25. Again, the vocabulary is going to be shared between the Revelation and, and Job on, on these points. The land beast is to be slain by God with a sword. Again, later in, in Revelation 13, you get that, and that's uh, Job 40, 19. The sea dragon conducts a war waged by his mouth. It's Job 40, 32. If you recall Revelation 13, the, the beast is speaking great things against, you know, God. Back to Beale and McDonough. So the sea dragon conducts a war waged by his mouth and burning torches, quote unquote, and a flame goes out of his mouth. It's Job 41, 11 and 13. Again, the Septuagint. There's nothing upon the earth like him. Job 41, 25. Again, going back to Revelation 13, this description of the beast as being like unique. I mean, there's, it's, it's the ultimate beast, you know, the ultimate, you know, chaos figure here. Beale and McDonough also say, Jewish tradition held that on the fifth day of creation, God created Leviathan to be in the sea and behemoth in the land counterpart to dwell on the land. So you have behemoth also known as Rahab. And they give some references here. First Enoch 60, 7 through 10, 4th Ezra 6, 49 through 52 and some scattered rabbinic texts. I mean, this is a Jewish tradition that, you know, God created both of these. These two beasts were symbolic of the powers of evil and were to be destroyed at the final judgment. Now, that part there, the destruction of Rahab and Leviathan at the final judgment, elsewhere in other episodes in the podcast, we've actually gotten into this because this is part of their destruction is part of the what scholars call the divine banquet motif, the, the, the final Passover, the final, you know, the Christians would call it the marriage supper of the Lamb, this great eschatological meal with God and with his people. And, and I've, I've asked before, well, you know, hey, do you know what's being served <laughs> at, at this meal? And in Jewish tradition, the answer was, yeah, Rahab, the, the behemoth, and Leviathan. That's what's, that's what's on the table. And it, again, it was a way of expressing the idea that chaos itself is going to be devoured. It's going to come to an end. Now, I'm going to read a little bit from um, Brand Petre's book, uh, Brant Petre, excuse me, Jesus and the Last Supper, about this Jewish theme, this theology. Again, this, this whole idea, I'm, I'm going to start where, where he's discussing the image of a banquet or this divine banquet idea in the Old Testament. So he writes this, again, this is his book on uh, or called Jesus and the Last Supper. Multiple passages in the Jewish scripture use the image of a banquet or feast to describe the joy of the coming age of salvation. However, by far the most explicit description of an eschatological banquet in the Old Testament is in the book of Isaiah. In the midst of a series of descriptions of the coming day of the Lord in Isaiah 24 and tw through 27, the prophet speaks of a future banquet for Israel and the nations. Then he starts to list out certain features of this banquet. So he writes, first, the coming feast is no ordinary banquet. It is an eschatological event. This eschatological dimension is evident from the fact that the banquet culminates in the overthrow of suffering and death. God will, quote, swallow up death forever, unquote, and wipe away tears from all faces. Indeed, just as just a few verses after describing the banquet, Isaiah goes on to speak about the resurrection of the bodies of the dead, Isaiah 26, 19. As Klausner suggests, the overall context of the banquet is Isaiah's vision of the cessation of death and the resurrection of the dead in the age to come. Second, the banquet is a feast of redemption. It will be tied to the forgiveness of sins. At the time of the banquet, 
God will take away, quote, the reproach of his people, unquote, and give them salvation. It's Isaiah 25, 8 through 9. Basically, you know, one, once, let me just interrupt here. The, the Messiah, again, the coming of Jesus in the, in the New Testament the first time around was a signal that the, that the exile is now ending. But the exile, this is an already but not yet thing. The exile isn't completely over until everything comes full circle. And not only God's people, Israel, but also those from the nations who follow the Lord are brought back into the family. They're no longer in exile. They're home. And this is, again, a day of the Lord, final eschatological event. Back to Petre. Third, the coming feast will be a cultic or sacrificial banquet. This is the meaning of the strange imagery of some of the language, fat things and wine on the lees. This is technical terminology for, for sacrificial offerings of the temple cult, as when Deuteronomy speaks of, quote, the fat of their sacrifices and, quote, the wine of their drink offering, unquote. Deuteronomy 32, 37, 38, Leviticus 3, 3, Leviticus 4, 8, 9. This cultic dimension is important to stress since Isaiah explicitly states that the banquet will take place, quote, on the mountain of the Lord which in context refers to Mount Zion in Jerusalem. That's Isaiah 24, 23. Yet another reason why the Lord appears, the whole battle of Armageddon thing, it's Jerusalem. Okay, it's Zion. It's not Megiddo, it's Zion. It's the Har Mohed, the Mount of Assembly. Again, the Mount where the Divine Council is. Okay, you know, all that stuff. That's unseen realm material, obviously. Fourth, back to Petre, in Isaiah, the eschatological banquet will be an international banquet, which will include both the restored tribes of Israel and the Gentile nations. The feast will be, quote, for all peoples, unquote, and will result in the veil that is cast over all the nations, or Gentiles, the goyim in Hebrew, being lifted. This is a startlingly universal vision of salvation nestled right in the heart of one of the most widely read prophets of the Old Testament. Fifth, and finally, given you know, again, the, a, a focus on Moses and Mount Sinai, which he had done earlier in his book. It is significant that several scholars have suggested that the banquet in Isaiah 25 alludes to and is modeled on the heavenly banquet of Moses and the elders atop Mount Sinai. Remember that? That's from Exodus 24, 9 through 11. They go up and they see the God of Israel. They have a, they have a meal with the God of Israel. Now, other banquet texts that he gets into in the book, obviously we don't have time to go through all these, Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, 62, 8, 9, 65, 13, 65, 17, and 18, Zechariah 9, 11, and 12, Zechariah 9, 16, and 17. This is not a, it's not a little thing. It's not a little theme. It's not like, like just one passage. It's not just Isaiah 24 through 27, but you've got a number of places that, that talk about this eschatological banquet with these themes. Petre also writes, perhaps the most elaborate description of the Messianic banquet comes to us from 2nd Baruch. Again, this is Second Temple Jewish literature, pseudepigraphical literature in this case, which is commonly dated to the first century AD. Although the text is long, it is worth quoting in full as it, per, is it, as it is perhaps the most full-blown expectation of the Messianic feast from the period. So he's going to quote um, this second Baruch passage. I'm going to quote at least part of it here. It reads, And it will happen that when all that which should come to pass in these parts has been accomplished, the Messiah will begin to be revealed. And behemoth, there's, there's the land beast, will reveal itself from its place. And Leviathan will come from the sea. The two great monsters which I created on the fifth day of creation, which I shall have kept until that time. And they, the two monsters, will be nourishment for all who are left. The earth will also yield fruits 10,000 fold, and on one vine will be a thousand branches, and one branch will produce a thousand clusters, and one cluster will produce a thousand grapes, and one grape will produce a core of wine. And those who are hungry will enjoy themselves, and they will more, moreover see marvels every day. And this is, this is the new earth description, okay? For winds will go out in front of me every morning to bring the fragrance of aromatic fields and clouds at the end of the day to distill the dew of health. And it will happen at that time that the treasury of manna will come down again from on high. Would you like bread with your meal? 
you know, <laughs> they, they're serving bread with Leviathan and behemoth. And they will eat of it in those years because these are they who will have arrived at the consummation of time. And it will happen after these things that when the time of the appearance of the anointed one, the Messiah, has been fulfilled and he returns with glory, then all who will, who sleep in hope of him will rise. There's the general resurrection. Dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, And it will happen at that time that those treasuries will be opened in which the number of the souls of the righteous were kept and they will go out and the multitudes of the souls will appear together in one assemblage of one mind. And the first ones will enjoy themselves and the last ones will not be sad. Everybody's going to going to love to be there. For they know that the time has come of which it is said that it is the end of times. And that's 2 Baruch 29, you know, on into chapter 30. Now, several aspects of the, this grand vision are worth highlighting. Petre, again, chimes in. First, the banquet is both eschatological and explicitly messianic, directly tied to the coming of the anointed one at the end of times. Second, it is important to stress that eating in the messianic age takes place not on a single occasion, but every day. Hence, the messianic banquet not only marks the beginning of the eschatological age, but is a feature of it in perpetuity. Third, the banquet is described in terms evocative of the exodus from Egypt. Its commencement will be marked by the return of the manna from heaven. It will take place alongside the return of the heavenly dew that brought the manna in the first place, Exodus 16, 13, and 14. Even the image of the superabundant wine and enormous clusters of grapes harks back to the gathering of the grapes in the land of Canaan by the emissaries of Joshua at the end of the Exodus. It's Numbers 13, 21 through 24. Fourth, and quite memorably, the righteous can also expect to feed on the flesh of Leviathan and Behemoth. It is not clear whether this image is hyperbolic and figurative or is intended as a literal description of the viands of the banquet. Either way, it seems to represent the triumph of the righteous over the destructive powers of this world. And lastly, but by no means least significantly, the inauguration of the Messianic banquet directly precedes the return of the Messiah to heaven and the resurrection of the righteous dead. So the Messiah comes and he goes, you know, back to heaven. This is the, again, this is a Jewish you know, portrait here. For a Christian in the book of Revelation, you would say the, the Messiah returns and heaven returns to earth. And so we transition from the return of the Messiah on into, again, the, the new earth, new heavens and new earth. It's right there. So back to Petrae. The banquet begins to be celebrated on earth during the days of the Messiah. It finds its ultimate fulfillment in the return of the pre-existing, pre-existent Messiah. There is an already but not yet even in Judaism. Apparently along with the resurrected righteous to heaven. Again, so this is common in, in Christian theology as well, that, that heaven, ever, you know, where, where we're going to be forever, is not the new earth. I actually believe it is the new earth. But this is very common to have heaven be some sort of non-earth ethereal existence. And, of course, that never answers the question, well, what what happens to the new earth then? Is it empty? But, again, that's just me. I don't want to drift off into into too many of my own criticisms of sort of a standard view. So back to Petrie. Just as the righteous on earth enjoy themselves during the days of the Messiah by eating the manna, so to those who are raised from the dead will enjoy themselves in the heavenly assemblage of the exalted Messiah. So. Again, where where does this leave us? Well, it's with the uh, it leaves us with the idea that these two beasts are ultimately chaos symbols. It's very obvious: Leviathan and Rahab, or Leviathan and Behemoth, if you like the Behemoth term, who wreak misery and destruction until they are defeated. And these two beasts may very well be what is behind the two beasts, one from the sea, one from the land, of Revelation thirteen. Now, that's actually the minority view. And it's it's really because of the prominence of Daniel 7 throughout Revelation 13 that this view is minority. And, and let, let's be honest, you know, I, most most people who are writing popular prophecy stuff, they, they never, they're completely unaware of this. You know, maybe, maybe they're out, maybe they've just had so much, have heard so many times or maybe even taught Leviathan, that's a dinosaur or something like that. And they, they miss all of this imagery. They miss all of the the Second Temple Jewish, you know, understanding of, of these images, these symbols, and, and what they mean with the eschatological banquet. I mean, it, it's all there. 
and, and it's it's frankly all there somewhere in the book of Revelation. It's just a, sort of a Christianized version of it because now we're we're post Jesus now when we're writing the book of Revelation. Again, we're we're not thinking completely like a a Jew who either was writing before Jesus or has rejected Jesus. You know, so Revelation is going to be a little bit different, but it's going to it's going to dip into all these wells. Okay, but again, most of your your popular prophecy writing is just completely unaware of this and and the, the very much aware of the next one and that's the Daniel 7 one so the second view is more common and more likely i mean it, it it's it's very likely i mean there's a lot of secure roots here but i still think that the the first view is is also on the table i don't think we have to pick and choose one i think they're both being utilized uh, by john and repurposed so i'm in agreement with beal here that that job 40 and 41 the leviathan and behemoth do play some role uh, in, in what's going on in Revelation 13, but that is not to ignore or sidestep Daniel 7. So the second view here is that the beasts are accountable through this passage in Daniel. So Beale and McDonough write sort of in summary uh, a few things here. They say the material in Revelation 13, 1 and 2 is a creative reworking of Daniel 7, 1 through 7, the beast coming up from the sea and his 10 horns in Revelation 13 are based respectively on Daniel 7, verses 2 and 3. And Daniel 7, verses 7, 20, and 24. Again, it's very obvious. They write, Many will understand the seven heads as a reference to an ancient Near Eastern sea monster myth from before the time of Daniel. He's referring here to the Ugaritic stuff, the, the defeat of Yom, the, again, the defeat of, of Leviathan, who is Yom in, in Ugaritic texts. And so he cites some Ugaritic texts here. He also cites Psalm 74, Psalm 89, 10, Isaiah 27, 1, because those passages dip in on a, on a linguistic level, the terminology, into Ugaritic material. So he's saying, you know, some understand the seven heads this way. It's, it's about this Canaanite depiction. They write, this is possible, but it is better to view the seven heads as a composite of the heads of all four of the beasts of Daniel 7. That might sound a little awkward. Let me just break in again. But, but basically, what they're gonna what they're gonna do, in what they write, is they're gonna take Revelation 13's description, and there there are various elements that are found in Daniel 7, but they're they're not drawn out in the same order as the beasts of Daniel 7. It, it's sort of a scatter shot um, assemblage that. You know, this comes from beast number one, that one's beast number four, this is beast number three, but but they're all applied to these two beasts in Revelation. So so they, they think it's just best to, you know, view the seven heads for one, and there's going to be other features that as just sort of, John is looking back at Daniel 7 and pulling things from any of the beasts at any given point. But, it, but Daniel 7 is the pool from which he does it. So back to Beale and McDonough, they write, the ten diadems upon the ten horns are a reference to Daniel's fourth beast, whose ten horns are interpreted as ten kings. That's Daniel 7.24. Likewise, the blasphemous names are connected with the blaspheming figure of Daniel 7, 8, and 11, who is also associated with the fourth kingdom, just like he is in Revelation 13, 5, and 6, or just like the blasphemy is. In Revelation 13, 2, they, they note, whereas in Daniel 7, 3 through 8, the images of the lion, bear, leopard, and terrifying beast represent four successive world empires, in Revelation 13, 1 to 2, all four of these images are applied to one beast. This probably includes a connotation of Rome as the fourth beast, which Daniel predicted would be more powerful and dreadful than the previous three beasts of Daniel 7, 4 through 6. Now, what they don't say there, I'll break in again, is that if you parallel Daniel 7 with Daniel 2, the, the kingdom of God begins, you know, the, the, the mountain not made with human hands, okay, that destroys the, the, the toes, all right? That, that is associated with the, again, the, the kingdom of God. That, that is the kingdom of God. In fact, it, Daniel is very pointed about saying that. Well, when does the kingdom of God get rolling? You know, when, when, does it, when does it take a foothold, pardon the pun? Well, that's during the time of the Messiah. And the time of the at the time of the Messiah, who, what was the world empire? It's Rome. So I mean, Rome is a pretty secure um, hook here into all this. Now I'm going to just go through Revelation 13, uh, not verse by verse, but I'm going to I'm going to pick things from different verses and just sort of link them back to Daniel 7, because this is what Beale and McDonough do in their commentary at this point. 
So Revelation 13, 3, let me just read that. Revelation 13, 3 says, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So there's that statement. And then a little bit later, in verse 14, it says that the beast was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Again, so it's apparently like a, it's cast a sort of a wound that should normally be fatal, but it lives. So they write, Beale and McDonough write, in Revelation 13, 14, it is added that it was a sword that struck the beast's head. The added mention of the sword in this connection recalls the prophecy of Isaiah 27, 1 in the Septuagint. Here we are back to the Leviathan thing, which says, quote, in that day, God will bring the sword and the holy and great mighty sword upon the dragon, the fleeing serpent upon the dragon, the crooked serpent. So if you're looking at that element, that that actually goes back to the, the first view that, that we're dealing with the two chaos monsters here, because it's it's a pretty clear allusion back to Isaiah 27, verse 1. If we go to Revelation 13, 4, the phrase denoting authority probably goes back to Daniel 7 and 6, even though the if we're reading the Septuagint of Daniel 7, this is going to be said of the third beast in particular. But again, the argument is, and I think it's a reasonable argument, that since all of the features of Daniel 7 are, are the beasts, the, the, the things about all the beasts in Daniel 7, John is drawing on all those things to portray two beasts, and, and most of them specifically go to the first beast. But verse 4 says they worship the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, so on and so forth. So that's probably an illusion. Uh, the argument is back to Daniel 7, 6. Let me just read that. Daniel 7, 6. I'll read it in, in English, not from the Septuagint. Uh, let's see here. As I looked, and behold, another like a leopard, four wings of a bird on its back, the beast had four heads, and dominion, i.e. authority, was given to it. So there seems to be a connection there. Daniel or Revelation 13, 5 and 6. The reference in verse 5 to the beast expressing his authority through speech has clear parallels in Daniel 7, verse 6, verse 8, verse 11, verse 20, and verse 25. Specifically, if you're looking at this in the Septuagint, in Daniel 7, verse 6 and verse 8, we read that a tongue was given to the beast, a mouth speaking great things. And again, that you get a good bit of that vocabulary in verses 5 and 6 in Revelation 13. Here's what it says. The beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name in his dwelling. So the beast was given, okay, a mouth, or he's given, again, this ability to speak. Okay, the, the, the given terminology is a little odd, but it actually comes from Daniel 7. That's, what, that's the language there. Verse 7, in Revelation 13, 7, the first part of it, the focus shifts back again to the prophecy of Daniel 7. So in verse 7, we have here, it was allowed, the beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And again, authority was given to it over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So if we go to Daniel 7 in the Septuagint, and I think it's around, yeah, verse 8. Let's just read Daniel 7, 8. And indeed, many counsels were being given among its horns. And behold, a different horn sprang up in the middle of them, a small one among its horns. And three of the previous horns dried up on account of it. And behold, eyes just like human eyes were in this horn, and a mouth speaking great boastful things. And it began to make war against the holy ones. And it's, it's, it's very clearly the source for Revelation 13. Uh, in verse uh, in verse 7. Go on to verse 10. Beale and McDonough write this. Let me just read verse 10 here. If anyone is to be taken captive, so or to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. This is a call for the endurance of the faith of the saints. So they write, again, this phrase, if anyone is destined for captivity, to, to captivity he must go, and so on, is a paraphrase combining Jeremiah 15 to Jeremiah 43, 11, where Jeremiah prophesies to Israel that God has destined them to go into captivity and suffer from the sword. This is a penalty for their unbelief and sin. In the present context here in Revelation 13, it appears to apply to genuine believers, though, who suffer persecution for their witness. Again, 
that I can see where, where you could go with that direction in the Septuagint. Again, what they're doing throughout this whole, their whole treatment of this is they're comparing the Greek of Revelation to, they're, they're looking up these terms, these, this vocabulary in the Septuagint. And you find out that the vocabulary here from verse 10 is a mixture from these two verses in Jeremiah. So you have the people of God, okay, not going into exile because of sin. That was the Jeremiah context. But the people of God suffering because of the beasts, okay, because they're under persecution. It's just that John draws this language. So many have noticed that these beasts, just generally, um, you know, this is just, I'm, I'm interjecting again. You, you probably noticed at this point that the beasts sort of imitate Christ in certain ways. You have this lethal wound that gets healed, for instance. You've got this authority, you know, given, you know, it, it's, it's illegitimate authority, but yet, again, some of this language you could find in Daniel 7 for the Son of Man and being given the kingdom and everlasting dominion and all this. But, you know, the, it, it seems like there's this counterfeit thing going on which would make sense because we're, we're, what we're headed to now is the mark of the beast and the, and the mark the, you know, is a number and a name. You bear the name of the beast. I, I think this is a good place to bring this up because really bearing the name is behind the name of the beast idea, not the number itself, but, but the concept of bearing the name, which is very old Testament. Okay. We had Carmen Imes on. This is what her whole book is about. You know, Bearing the name at Sinai, you know, the, the, this thing about how in ancient Israel there was this concept, it's really imaging, but in the book of Exodus and, and throughout the Torah, the idea of imaging God, being God's proxy, as it were, gets recycled and re-expressed in terms of bearing the name of Yahweh every day in life and among the nations. You represent him. You are his proxies. You are his kingdom of priests, a, a holy nation. You corporately, the whole country, the whole nation was supposed to represent him. They were supposed to be his image, and they bore his name. We're going to get into some some Torah passages here that talk about this. But if that's the case, again, then, then what you have here is the beasts, and, and again, ultimately with this number and so on and so forth, this is a counterfeit idea. Now, for, for Christians who read the book of Revelation, they they can see the the antichrist the the false christ idea the 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 opposer christ or poser christ i guess you could say i i, t I tend to think of antichrist not as being a a sort of fake but as being a sort of a, a a mirror counterpart enemy that sort of thing so that that's very common for for believers you know who are you know studying scripture and getting into prophecy to to see that but what they don't see is how the, the name of the beast, bearing the name, is also a counterfeit. And on the other side of it is bearing the name of Christ. And both of these are really, they're really metaphors, okay, for who you align yourself with, who you represent, just whose proxy are you? Are you the proxy of the God of Israel and Jesus, or are you the proxy of the beast? Okay, this is what bearing the name refers to. So we often don't 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 see that because maybe we're just too fixated on what the number means or you know antichrist, the false Christ. Okay, that, I, I get that, but there's an anti name bearing thing going on here too. It's a pseudo counterpart, and if if you have that in your head, then at least the the rationale, at least the the concept of bearing the mark, which is the name of the beast, okay, that that has an Old Testament flavor to it that makes it comprehensible. It's not about wearing barcodes, okay? It's not about stuff like this. It's about whose side are you on? And yeah, you could talk about how believers or whoever, whoever in the world might be manipulated into turning against the Lord and, and following the beast. I, I, I understand that. There, there's a lot of latitude here on, as to how this would sort of get lived out if, if we were like right here present at the time, you know, with all this stuff going on. But fundamentally, it is about what or who is your believing loyalty choice? Is it Jesus or is it the beast? 
whose name do you bear? Okay. Who is your master? Who is your owner? Okay. <laughs> All these things that go into, into name bearing as a concept. Now, you know, I, I, th I think, again, this is, this is really significant to observe. Beale and McDonough sort of touch on this. Um, I, I, I think they could do a much better uh, job of it than they do, they, you know, again, especially with the bearing of the name thing. But they do get into the idea of imitation. I, I'll just give you one paragraph. And, and this is worth noting, but, but again, I, I wish they would go further with the idea. They say the idea of imitation is carried on in 1313. First, the beast's activities are described by an ironic echo of the acts of Moses, whose prophetic authority was validated by doing great signs. Let's go to Revelation 13.13. 13. So what do we read there? Uh, it, again, the, the second beast, performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it, it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, so on and so forth. Well. Yeah, you get Moses, if you want to associate that with Moses, with the hail, okay, and, and just generally doing great signs. Okay, I, I get it. But but it's actually more Elijah here. And they, and they get to this point. They, they Again, he lists out a few Exodus passages about Moses doing great signs and says this is a counter, what the beast is here is, a, is sort of a counterfeit of that. Even in the Exodus narrative, they write, Exodus 7, 11, Pharaoh's magicians did the same signs with their secret arts. This is reinforced by Daniel where God is praised for doing signs and wonders. And Daniel 4.37 in the Septuagint aligns very well in their notes to Revelation 13.13. 13. The casting down of fire from heaven in the presence of people recalls the prophetic demonstration of Elijah, 1 Kings 18, 38, and 39, and also 2 Kings 1, 10 through 14. Though now, here in Revelation 13, it's a pseudo-prophetic action. All right? Again, all of that is sure. But I, I wish they would do a little bit more with it. So better than pseudo-prophetic, I, I wish they would, would get into something like this. If Jesus is a superior Moses and a superior Elijah, and he is, and those ideas are, are, are present in the Gospels, Jesus is the new Moses, he is superior to Elijah, who is the forerunner. If that's the case, then these beasts mime both the idea of a pseudo-Christ, okay, they, they certainly do that, but when they, you know, when they do it, they are still, again, it's almost like a recognition of, of what, what or who they need to imitate to have legitimacy because Christ is superior, and that's why it's happening this way. The beast is sort of trying to pass himself off as the quote new Moses and new Elijah, and it's a direct counterpart to the new Moses and superior to Elijah portrayal of Jesus in the Gospels. I, I just wish they would have spent more time on that. But anyway, um, you know, let, let's get into the 666 a little bit. So we have it described in verses 17 and 18 as the number of a man. It's also described as the name of the beast. And so the, the, the imitation trajectory, again, makes sense, that, that except in this case, we're miming the followers of either Yahweh or Jesus or the beast. Again, who is your proxy? You know, or you're, you're a proxy for whom, I should say. So if the point of 666 is bearing the name, you know, and as followers of Christ bear his name, so the followers of the beast would bear that name. In other words, as we have people who align themselves with Jesus, they're gonna, they're gonna, their believing loyalty is in Jesus. You're going to have a lot of other people whose believing loyalty is in the beast. Now, Christians obviously didn't literally bear the name I mean, they're, they're not stamped or branded or anything like that. And neither did the Israelites, even when the name was given to them. Do you realize that the name was given to Israelites? This is number six. You, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've heard the passage. This is the priestly blessing, but the, the terminology, you know, actually, you know, matters here. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons saying, thus you shall bless the people of Israel. So God says to Moses, you know, tell Aaron, this is what you say to the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And here's verse 27. That's, see, that's where the, the blessing ends, but we forget about verse 27. So shall they. Again, the priests, the Aaron pre, Aaronid priests, so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel 
and I will bless them. So the people of Israel bore the name, not in a, in a literalistic view, little literalistic way, but that's what number six says. This is, this is the result of it. So the mark is a parody of this idea. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a fake. It's an imitation. It's a pseudo bearing the name idea. Spiritually speaking, whose side are you on? You know, and, and we, we see this with 144,000 because they're, they're sealed and marked. So, the, you know, it, the, the mark is a, is a parody of that as well. But we miss this, this other corporate idea. Now, here's, so, you know, some commentators have, have looked at this and thought, well, okay, you say the Israelites didn't literally bear the name. We understand what's being meant there. But the name of the Lord actually does get described as being worn by Israelites. <laughs> on the forehead and the hand. And if this sounds a little strange, again, because that's where the mark of the beast goes, just let's Beal and McDonough summarize it this way. In the Old Testament, God told Israel that the Torah was to be, quote, as a sign on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead in order to remind them continually of their commitment and loyalty to God. This was done, that's Exodus 13, 9, Exodus 13, 16, Deuteronomy 6, 8. This was done with phylacteries, leather pouches, containing portions of Scripture worn on the forehead and arm. The New Testament equivalent is the invisible seal or name of God, Revelation 7, 2, and 3. That's the 144,000. The forehead represents their ideological commitment and the hand, the practical outworking of that commitment. Now, it's interesting that if the Greek word for hand, care, which is used here in, Re in Revelation 13, it can mean arm even though that's rare. So I just want to throw that out. But again, I, I, what do we think of the parallel? It's interesting. Uh, I actually think the ironic blessing captures the idea better, but it is nevertheless an interesting sort of point for point kind of analogy that, that could be made. Now, some scholars have taken this you know the the this the, the Jewish idea here, and they they see again the, this this counterpart in Revelation thirteen, and of course they're bound to speculate about the the, the bad mark. All right, is is there a literal equivalent somewhere uh, in this, or, or or is it all just sort of spiritual representation? You know, I, I'm arguing for spiritual or theological representation. Bearing the name spiritual here is is the point. You bear the mark. You bear the name of the beast, that means you're on his side. Just like the positive side, you bear the, bear the name of the Lord, you bear the name of Christ. You're not carrying a physical mark with you. It's just that's where your loyalty is. So I'm arguing that's, that's the whole point of the bearing the name and the mark and all this stuff. But there are others, you know, again, who try to find the, 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 a more literal sort of equivalent. So On notes one second temple parallel. He says, according to 3rd Maccabees 2, 28 and 29, Ptolemy IV, Philopater, who lived 221 to 2, or he reigned 221 to 204 BC, inaugurated a program of persecution against Egyptian Jews in which he required them to enroll in a census and to be branded with the ivy leaf of Dionysus. Those who did not cooperate were executed. It is likely that Ptolemy IV, who was particularly devoted to Dionysus, also himself sported this brand. Again, well, is that really what John's thinking about? I don't know. It, 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 it feels a little dubious to me, but I thought I would, I would mention it. You have Psalms of Solomon, another possible point of reference. And this is Second Temple Jewish literature. Psalms of Solomon 15, 9 through 14 says this. They will flee from the holy ones like those pursued in battle. They will pursue and capture sinners. Those who do lawlessness will not escape the judgment of the Lord. They will be captured as if by experienced warriors. For the sign of destruction is upon their forehead, and the inheritance of sinners is destruction and darkness. Their lawless acts will pursue them to Hades below. Well, again, this stamping on the forehead thing, it, it, it's not really the same context. Here it's aimed against Jews. I, I, again, I doubt this is what John's thinking about. Now, I, I would say there's a general weak point to all of this, and that's the buying or the selling. So I, you know, my my own predilection here, if we get interpretive to this to this extent, is that I look at Revelation 13 with the two beasts again, which I, I view as 
as metaphors for chaos, basically the whole world gone to hell. And Christians, as a result, are persecuted by the chaos system. Part of that persecution is going to be you can't buy or sell. So that I, I take it as a point of oppression, but I don't think it, it's based upon a, a physical mark that anybody's taking. I do think it, it's based on the fact that you're a Christian. That's enough to target you, that you will refuse to denounce Christ, to deny Christ, and assign your loyalty to the beast, i.e. to the, to the anti-Christ system. That alone is sufficient to say, well, you're not shopping here. So I, 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 that actually feels more sinister <laughs> to me than, again, some of the scenarios that, that people come up with. But this, again, scholars, again, try to ferret out possible ways that buying and selling fit in with a physical mark. And none of it has an Old Testament context. It's all Greco-Roman. So Owen, for instance, writes this, the connection of buying and selling with the karagma, in, in, it's the Greek term, the mark of the beast, has been understood as a reference to the use of Roman coins, which bore the portraits and names of Roman emperors. The inability to buy or sell would then be the result of refusing to use Roman coins. He writes, this has a parallel in the Jewish prohibition of images, which for some, such as the zealots, included the image of the emperor on Roman coins. Well, really? I mean, it, again, it, it just feels weak. I mean, this is nice, but that isn't really what the passage describes, refusing to use coins. It says you can't buy or sell. It doesn't say that Christians refuse to use coins. It doesn't say that the image is on coins. The image is on the hand of the forehead. Okay, again, which, which has theological you know, imagery to it that we've already talked about in this episode back into the Old Testament. The word of the Lord, again, the, the name being placed upon the people of God by the priests. To me, that, that makes a whole lot more sense than, than making the passage talk about, I don't want to use those coins. But again, this is kind of where people go. Now, now Owen knows this, and he admits later, he says, quote, there's no evidence that people were stamped on their hands or foreheads with coin images. Well, no, there isn't. And, and so uh, it's nice that we can, you know, be forthright there. But I think he, he and other commentators more or less just struggle with this. So in the last part of our episode, what about the number itself? Well, I hate to disappoint people. Maybe you won't go away disappointed after I say what I say. But there's no real secure Old Testament contribution here. Now, when I say secure, I mean there, there's nothing that, that I can look at or anybody else can find in the text that really fits well with the number 666. In other words, it's not like, hey, we can go through, Daniel, we can go through Revelation 13, and there's like 30 places where we can see Daniel is quoted in the Septuagint. I mean, we just gave a little sampling here in this episode. There's nothing like that for the number. Typically, what you get in commentaries is you get suggestions of people whose names could correspond to this. And they're all Greco-Roman. They all have weaknesses, which, is, again, is why this hasn't, hasn't been resolved. So the typical name explanations like Nero, well, yeah, Nero works if you spell his name a certain way, like one of them is you add an N to it, which, again, that, it, that, that was a spelling for Nero. So, Okay. Domitian, you can get to Domitian through gematria, again, letters corresponding to numbers, depending on what the spelling used, depending on if you use sort of a, a nickname or an abbreviation part of it. <laughs> it. It just feels like cheating at some point, okay? Uh, another candidate would be Pythagorean magic squares. Magic squares are essentially Sudoku, you know, where the top, the vertical line, horizontal line, diagonal lines, they all add up to the same number, Okay. So some have pointed out that 666 is the Pythagorean magic square of the sun. So now you get solar deity imagery in there, Zeus and whoever. You know, and Owen calls these triangular numbers and so do other scholars, but you know, magic square is what, what I'm used to. Uh, again, is this really what we're talking about? You know, would, would, would John have, have known of the Pythagorean system? Now, there are, there are actually serious weaknesses to the Pythagorean element here. And I put this in the protected folder. I, I came across, uh, I didn't have this earlier when we got to some of the numbers elsewhere, you know, earlier in the book of Revelation, but I was able to procure uh, something this week 
that I'm putting in the protected folder. And for those of you who are like really into Bible number stuff, this is the article. Okay. In other words, when I say that, this is the most thorough treatment of the subject. It's 60, it's over 60 pages. It's by Adela Yarbrough Collins. And her treatment here is basically, basically has not been superseded. So it's called numerical symbolism in Jewish and early Christian apocalyptic literature. She goes through everything. Dead Sea Scrolls, Philo, Enoch, you know, New Testament, Pythagoras, all of it. Okay. It's a great article, but it doesn't solve the problem. All of these suggestions are Greco-Roman. Now, I find the one that's most intriguing, just to, to drift off into Greco-Roman land here, and, and there's a reason why I find it intriguing, that does link back to the Old Testament, is Irenaeus' suggestion. And I, I wrote about this in, in Reversing Hermon, but I'm, I'm going to give you, this is John J. Collins in DDD. This is the, the first Collins. This is actually her husband. He has the entry on uh, Titans in DDD, and he writes this. The name Titan, Titan, is not found as such in the writings of the New Testament, but may be hidden in 666 in Revelation 13, 18, the number of the beast and also of a man. One of the solutions of this riddle that have been listed by Irenaeus, Irenaeus actually lists a few of these, but this is the one that is most interesting. So Colin says, one of the solutions happens to be Teton. There's a specific spelling. And this is something Irenaeus brings up in his book, or his writing against heresies, 5, 30, and 3. So it happens to be Teton, of which the numerical values 300 plus 5 plus 10 plus 300 plus 1 plus 50 add up to 666. Irenaeus comments that this solution is particularly convincing to himself, or is is particularly convincing to himself because it is not the name of an actually venerated God or known King, but nevertheless a divine and kingly, even a tyrant's name. So it, it gave a certain flexibility. Interestingly enough, you know, everybody, everybody says that the Nero thing solves the 666 problem. Irenaeus doesn't even bring it up. He doesn't even bring Nero up. He's well acquainted with Nero folks. And he didn't find that at all persuasive or even interesting. So he takes this different trajectory. Now, why should we care? Again, I discussed this a bit in Reversing Hermon with 666 and Titan, Teton. There's no direct Old Testament reference here. So it's an analogical argument. Basically, it goes like this. 666 points to a Titan. The Titans were the giants, okay? You know, the Greco-Roman retelling of Genesis 6. One of those was Nimrod in Jewish tradition. Not in the Bible. You know, Nimrod is called a Gibor, and Gibor does not have to mean giant. David is called a Gibor. God is called a Gibor. Okay, it doesn't have to mean giant. So let's get that straight. But you go from 666 to Titans to Giants to Nimrod. And Nimrod, of course, is associated with, drumroll please, Babel. And of course, Revelation's Antichrist is associated with Babel, Babylon the Great Whore. Again, the, the, there's no biblical text that makes those connections but they're interesting. So I wrote in reversing Hermon this little bit here. The point being made here is not that Antichrist will be a giant. Okay, please. No biblical or Enochic text draws such a conclusion. Rather, the material indicates that Second Temple Jewish readers of Revelation may have parsed the Antichrist as having a direct association with the fallen watchers, the classical titans, and the giants. That, that's, that's possible. And the Nimrod trajectory establishes that possibility. So I, I kind of like that because I, I, I think that there is some, the, the number has something to do with Babel. That's kind of obvious though, because keep reading Revelation, you get Babel on the great whore. I mean, that, that, that's kind of obvious. So I'm, I'm not like patting myself on the back here that I've seen something, you know, that no one else has seen. Everybody sees this who reads it. So I, I that what I'm interested in is what's the Babel connection? Now, we certainly have a chaos connection with the, with the two beasts. That, that's in play, absolutely. And then we get this number. And, and what I want to see, what, where I think the answer is going to be, and we may never find it, but it's going to have some connection to, to Babel chaos stuff. Now, I have to mention one other thing. I also um, recently came across an article that 
tries to make the argument 666 from the Old Testament. And I don't find this persuasive at all. I'm going to tell you why, but I'm, I also put this in the protective folder. So 666 as a number is actually mentioned three times in the Old Testament. The first one is it is that it's the number of the talents of gold that Solomon collected each year. It's mentioned in 1 Kings 10, 14, 2 Chronicles 9, 13. So those are two of the references. The third reference is Ezra 2, 13, where Adonai Kam has 666 sons, descendants. Okay, well, that, that's it. There's, there's nothing to build on there. There's nothing said about Adonai Kam and you know, all this stuff. So that, that, that's where you get the number. Now, this particular article by Brent Strawn and Keith Bodner entitled Solomon and 666, Revelation 13, 18. This is from New Testament Studies. Volume 66, which is 2020, so it's very recent, pages 219 um, to, let's, 319, oh, I, I messed up the numbers here, I can't remember what page numbers it actually is, and I don't want to open the file right now, but it's, you know, it's, it's 8, 10 pages, it's not real long. Here's what they argue. This is from their, their abstract. The present article argues that 666 in Revelation 13, 18 is best related to the notice of Solomon receiving 666 talents of gold. 1 Kings 10, 14, 2 Chronicles 9, 13, which is in turn an important notice of this king's wayward and unjust practices, his inordinate wealth, exploitation of his own people, and eschewing of God's law. So basically, in, in non-academies, Solomon got 666 talents of gold. He got lots of other stuff too, but the 666 talents, and that shows that, that Solomon was an evil, sinister monarch that was just milking everybody for his wealth, and he exploited his own people. And this is one of the things that you're not supposed to do as a king, according to the Torah. And so that becomes why we see 666 used of the Antichrist. Yeah, I don't find this at all persuasive for one big reason, and they actually try to address this in, in the article and do not do a good job of it. Solomon's portrayal in Second Temple, Second Temple Jewish literature is not a bad one. He's an exorcist. He has power over demons. Basically, he's the exact opposite of what he would be if, if he turns out to be the foil or the, or the, the touch point for the Antichrist. So I, I think this is really weak. But I wanted to mention it because some of you will know that the number 666 occurs in the Old Testament. There you go. Again, I, don't, I just don't find that option persuasive. I don't find any of the, the Greco-Roman options persuasive. I, you know, I'll admit that I'm influenced by Irenaeus here. If he yawned at the suggestion of Nero, well, to me that says something. Um, and again, all of these these systems that try to align with certain names, they, they, they kind of cheat a little bit, you know, to make it work. None of these things has, has won the day. The, the closest you get to a consensus is the Nero thing, but people are very quick to point out that you have to fiddle a little bit. It, the, the one advantage it has is it also accounts for the textual variance, 616. Some some passages or some manuscripts of Revelation 13, 18 do not say 666, they say 616. And, and if, you have, if you spell Nero an altogether different way, you can get 616. So it can account for both of them. But to me, that just sort of demonstrates somewhat the artificiality of it. And again, if Irenaeus just thought, why would we even think that? To me, that, that suggests something there. That To me, that's actually a strong argument that I... We don't need to take Nero too seriously because Irenaeus is very close, you know, a lot closer than we are to the period. He's, you know, one of the early fathers. He knows all about Nero because Nero put Paul and Peter to death. I mean, you would think if if this idea of of Nero being the beast, this Nero, uh, this this legend of Nero being revived and all this stuff, you think as as sort of how that circulated, and it did circulate in the ancient world. People were freaked out by Nero that he would come back from the dead and all this, you know, not even for biblical reasons, just generally. There's that. It's current. People are thinking about it. They're talking about it. They fear it. You've got this number thing going on, and Irenaeus doesn't even bat an eye, not even on the radar. Gives it no consideration at all. Again, to me, that that is, is a good argument against it. 
So again, none of these things are, are going to solve the problem. I've, you know, just to summarize here as we close, what, the what I prefer again is, I, I, you know, I'll prefer something that has a connection to Babel. And right now, all you have is is an analogous reasoning chain, you know, that that goes back to you know Teton, the Titans, and Hermon, and Nimrod, and all this kind of stuff. You have you have to dip into into Second Temple Jewish thinking about Nimrod. Um, and, and, and equate him with Babel. And that, and it's possible. All these things are possible. All the elements of this logic chain are possible. The problem is, is that the logic chain is never spelled out in Scripture. Not even, not even part of the logic chain is spelled out in Scripture. All of the links in the chain are isolated from each other, scripturally speaking, except for Nimrod and Babel. That's, that's about the only one you've got. There's a direct connection there. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in the, in, the, in the quandary that we started with. Nobody knows really what this specifically is talking about, and there really isn't a clear Old Testament precedent. Maybe what I've just suggested is, 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 is the right way to think about it. I don't know, neither does anybody else, because we're dealing with a, really the absence of data when it comes uh, to text, at least you know, to this point, as, as far as I've been able to to find and you know I've, I've looked at a lot of stuff so I'm, I'm not holding my breath but that that's kind of where where we are with the whole issue so th- the real meat here is with the beasts I think it helps I think it helps solidify a chaos orientation uh, to the whole chapter and again with that you know we'll bring this one to a close that's really the Old Testament contribution to Revelation 13. Mike 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 no 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 I'm going to need a current name that you think. <laughs> You're gonna disappoint. We could, you could have just said you could have saved us an hour. Just said I don't know. I'm just <laughs> you could have just said up front. I don't. Well, know. There's plenty of things we do podcasts. know in here. We want we want a name, Mike. You know we need uh, we need to spill the tea, as they say now. You ever heard that? Spill the tea. It's what all the I I have I have heard that too yeah. many times actually. Yeah. We need to uh, <laughs> we need a current name. You know how many times I've heard people say names even at my church i don't want to say anything about or speak anything but henry just... kissinger's still alive he was he was the antichrist when i was growing up so he's still alive yeah. we'll, we'll go with him yeah or hitler he's coming back yeah and there, there you go <laughs> yeah there you go uh, you go really far down the rabbit hole with chapter 13 there oh sure oh. all right mike well next week chapter 14 Get it into the 144,000 again. Yeah, yeah. We'll, and we, we won't spend a whole lot of time on, on that part of the chapter because, you know, we, we did so much with it earlier on. But, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to hit them again. That's, they're unavoidable because, hey, there they are. But there's plenty of other stuff in, in Chapter 13 and, of course, on into 15. And it, I don't know. I'll have to take a look at it. But we might be able to do 14 and 15 together because the plagues are there. We We've had a lot of that language already too, so we'll we'll see. But we're making we're making good progress. All right, you know, perfect. at least we can say that much. All right, sounds good, Michael. I'm disappointed. No computer chips and no modern names have been named in this episode, but that's okay. No, no, but the emails will keep coming. Yeah. You can email <laughs> Mike, not me. But all right, Mike. Well, with that, we look forward to chapter 14 next week, and I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.